Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to this talk. Um, game engines for non-games. Is the dream still alive? Of course, I chose a clickbait title. It is mostly hyperbolic. <laughs> um, but essentially, what I want to talk to you today about is a cycle of extreme excitement and then the realities of the matter when you're out in the field. Um, this is a little bit of who I am. I uh, worked in IT for more than 12 years. I worked as a software engineer at WebFX. And then I had my own software consulting company for a while. Um, I worked for a couple of years in local government, building a 3D replica of a city in Unreal Engine, which led me to work on the private sector, creating digital experiences for infrastructure and engineering projects. I am currently a freelance Unreal Engine consultant and I continue to assist small and big companies with their interactive applications. At the same time, I am working on my first commercial game as a solo uh, developer. Um, and um, these are some of the things that I worked on um, in this area. I have been involved one way or another in projects that use Unreal Engine in interesting ways for the past four years. Uh, starting in the pandemic, when I worked on an LED virtual production proof of concept, experimenting with what at the time was very new plugins and tools to capture real performances in a virtual set background. Um, after that, I had the privilege to become part of the small team that created a 3D model of Wellington City in Unreal Engine for the internal use of Wellington City Council. Uh, the main objective of these projects was to create a tool that would show the people of the city the consequences of climate change and help them make decisions about adaptation. This is where I became familiar with the concept of digital twin, and I was involved in many initiatives to understand the possibilities of the technology and actually implementing it for different uses. Then I moved into the private sector. I worked on an engineering consulting company and uh, for other public and private entities as a contractor. I built many applications, some smaller, some bigger, where the overall goal was to explore the potential of real-time 3D engines for things that were historically done by other tools, or in some cases, created a completely new way of doing certain things. An example of this is an interactive wind farm simulation where people could see the view of the windmills from their house and move around in the 3D space, which normally is done by carefully crafted compositions of photography that are presented from a fixed position. This is to say, I have been there through the last cycle of excitement for game engines in other sectors, the really good press and boom of resources thrown at it, and then the trial and error to find which is actually a good place for it. Right, um, so you might have seen me using the term hype, and I thought it would be a good idea to clarify what I mean by it. Uh, to be really honest, I had to look up the meaning of the word to see if I was using it correctly. Um, I think I did, because what I found is that hype comes from the act of promoting advertising or pushing something, making people interested in it. Um, the key component for me is that hype not only generates interest, but it can also build up expectations which may or may not come true. So yes, I think we did have a bit of a hype situation happening for game engines outside of game development in the recent past, which has slowed down noticeably in the past year. Let me show you what I mean. Um, game engines have been around for a good while, and applications in other sectors were already happening in particular projects where a good defined use case presented itself even though these projects may have done well in their respective goals, something accelerated the press and promotion cycle, and game engines entered the discourse, taking big swings and amplifying the message further. I'm not a specialist, sorry, I'm not a specialist in market trends or economy or anything like that. But when I looked at the dates, many of these um, talking points started in 2020. Remember 2020? <laughs> um, yeah, I pushed it all 
into the hidden box with traumatic memories in my brain. <laughs> Um, so I went on the internet and I found that analysts and consultants from the business business world actually reported on it and confirmed my suspicions. The pandemic shifted a lot of things into the digital world much faster than what we were doing before, mainly because we were not able to do things in person anymore. Um, but because many industries were struggling. Um, we look at tech at the time as a life raft that was going to take us back to some sort of economic stability. Of course, there are other factors and historical developments that took us there, but the timing is too much to just be a coincidence. In particular, around the time, the two biggest game engine companies, Unity and Epic for Unreal Engine, started to promote and support more and more of these use cases. This is the time I came into the scene to ride this hype wave. Uh, right, so the conditions were given for this cool era of experimentation and innovation, and we were working hard to live up to the potential of the technology. New tools, plugins, integrations, and amazing proof of concept projects started showing up through this growth period. Let's look into it. This is a very rough timeline of what I think were some of the defining moments in the recent history of game engines in other spaces. You can see a concentration of advances and tools coming up during the middle period, and also how both Epic and Unity made strategic moves to try and control a bigger size of the market. Particularly in 2021, we had the term metaverse entering the mainstream thanks to Facebook rebrand and a big bet to create a virtual 3D world. Imagining this massive interactive virtual world was one thing, but actually creating it and deploying it, as well as the mass adoption of it required many other things to come into place. Some of these technology advancements were in the geospatial world, where existing players such as Esri and new ones like Cesium started to collaborate with the game engine companies to integrate their tools, making the use of real-world data easier than ever. In particular, Epic Games took several steps that were quite massive at the time. They bought the company Quixel, that had a large library of real-world 3D scan data and made their Megascans catalog free to use with Unreal Engine. They also acquired Twinmotion, an easy-to-use visualization tool from the architecture world, and made it free. They accelerated the development and integration of many of their different offerings, such as the data conversion tool Datasmith, to enable the import and use of many different data assets from other software into Unreal Engine. With Unreal Engine 5, they focus on large worlds, geometry optimization, and better realism, which will benefit architecture, engineering, and construction, as well as simulation industries. Not only did they make these tools available and accessible, but they also invested a lot of development and marketing time into collaborations with these sectors, creating this atmosphere of rapid growth. In the wider context, we have other big tech players entering the scene, such as NVIDIA, Amazon, and Google, each trying to find their strength in this world of possibilities. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but in terms of how they affected the landscape of big virtual worlds and interoperation between industries, I thought I could pick some of these to show you. In particular, I think it's worthy to mention uh, USD or Universal Scene Description becoming open source and the subsequent adoption of this file type by the NVIDIA Omniverse platform. Having a particular standard to share 3D data in an interconnected virtual world is one of the key factors to adoption. And NVIDIA choosing to use this standard, which was developed in the VFX industry, brought up its profile and opened up possibilities beyond having isolated single-use platforms. Amazon, of course, wanted to be a part of the conversation and due to their strong position in the cloud computing area, rushed to the public offering 
cloud-based simulation tools which integrated into game engines. Google was sitting pretty in their geospatial and AR offerings, but came back into the spotlight by opening up their 3D photogrammetry data sets of the world and integrating them with Cesium, which brought it into Unreal and Unity. In this context, we can see there was a steady supply of technology improvements and that brought huge potential to game engines. At this time is when we see innovation and experiments develop and come into the public eye. I'll show you some of these examples. Uh, City Digital Twins. From my personal experience working in a city 3D digital replica, I can tell you, virtual cities bring this childlike excitement to our collective imagination like no other. When I started working building Wellington, there were a few other specific cities that had these beautiful 3D models, such as Shanghai, Helsinki, and Adelaide. Wellington was one of the pioneers in this area, with the creation of several iterations of models in Unity and Unreal Engine. But the most popular at the time was the one made by a New Zealand company uh, called Bill Media, which is now the boundary. You can see why. Wellington is a very aesthetically pleasing looking city, uh, with the hills, the harbour and all the greenery sprinkled throughout. The potential of having a functional, interconnected digital twin of the real world was easy to imagine looking at the familiar landscapes of a city. Uh, other wonderful examples that showcase the potential of game engines in the film and TV or more broadly linear content creation areas started popping up as well. So notable mentions um, the collaboration between Kiwi Company, WebFX, and Unreal Engine with the Meerkat animation demo, as well as the Matrix Awakens demo. And in the world of content for streaming, um, live shows and other interactive experiences, um, many examples started popping up, combining motion capture with real performances from bigger and smaller players. But nothing lasts forever, and then we enter some turbulent times. These are some of the things that happened in the past year or so, which led me to question, is the dream still alive? Right, 2024. Along with the generalized feeling that things are very hard right now for some reason, um, which some of us call a recession, although economists try not to use that word. Um, many changes unfolded in the ecosystem of interconnected tools that allowed the game engine boom to begin with. On the Epic side, we have the change of the licensing system of Unreal Engine, which was previously free for non-games, moving into a seed-based subscription system. Then the consolidation of our station, Sketchfab and Quixel into the new platform Fab, which comes with a surprise change of making mega scans no longer free. Not only were these customer facing pricing changes happening, but they also followed the layoff trends happening in tech in general, specifically dissolving the entire business units dedicated to AEC and simulation development and promotion. This gave the message that these offerings were no longer a priority for Epic after a period of rapid growth in that area. And then we have Unity. <laughs> um, Unity did not fare much better during this turbulent time. Um, I feel like some of the events uh, in this timeline that I'm showing you here uh, were quite public and I don't want to twist the knife further. <laughs> Uh, for the Unity community, so let me just say, things got a bit messy. Remains to see how they will pick themselves back up now, probably going back to their core offering of game dev, uh, but the, this is not super clear to me right now. Okay, so this is where I will speak to some of the things that I saw in my personal experience that I believe may create 
roadblocks for an adoption of this technology by other industries. Of course, there are other huge factors that contribute to the slowdown in adoption that I just show you, such as the economic context. But I want to tell you a bit of what I saw from an inside perspective. I cannot talk from the film industry as much, so please keep this in mind. Um, I uh, th what I'm going to show you comes from the experience that I had and um, in this kind of projects in the public sector infrastructure and advisory. Um, game development has been around for a long time and it has systems, processes, software, communication styles and more that have slowly grown to feed the needs of the medium, that is, to make a game. The same can be said for on the industries. If you want to build a real bridge, for example, there are procedures you have to follow. Very accurate models and predictions need to be done and norms and regulations that have to be adhered to. It is only natural that some things will be harder to do, but mostly to understand when you're moving from one industry to the other. There is a lot of time that is spent explaining how things work, and then even after doing so, figuring out a plan remains difficult. Some examples of these situations. When creating a video game, you're trying to craft an experience for a specific audience. And this audience helps guide you in your design of the game. For example, a, pers a first person shooter, uh, your, your audience is first person shooter fans. And they will come with attached expectations of rel and related demographics. However, when making a tool for public consultation, for example, your audience is each and every person in a town or city many of whom don't have previous experience with game mechanics or controllers. Other example, um, developing any game usually takes a fair bit of time. Creating and releasing 3D interactive games may take anywhere between two years, five years, sometimes more. In an engineering consulting context, the time allocated for 3D visualization is usually much shorter. We're talking weeks. The process from ideation to development has to be condensed by a lot in this case. Third example, um, when developing a game, many different specialities need to be come together. Game design, UI, programming, 3D modeling, 3D environment design, narrative, sound, etc. This is accepted and understood in the nature of the work being done. But when moving to corporate consulting, for example, uh, you usually have only one or two people per project. Um, achieving similar results to people in games requires multi-talented people, a longer time frame, or a healthy reduction of the expectations when it comes to possible outcomes. Uh, these are not deal breakers, uh, but they do make for misunderstandings and slow down in adoption. Um, this is hard to... Um, explain what is not known by experience, so a certain level of trust and flexibility is required. Um, but don't let my previous slides discourage you, um, because when looking at the situation in context, we can see similar cycles of extreme hype around a certain technology followed by a crash, which ultimately didn't mean the end of those advancements. It is so common, in fact, that I found a graph from something called Garner Hype Cycle uh, from an American IT research company, uh, which illustrates the, phenom illustrates the phenomenon quite well. At least for me, it's like that Ooh, going up and then crashing down. Um, from my understanding, we are somewhere around the proud of disillusionment at the moment, um, slowly climbing the slope of enlightenment. To start with, we might think the technology is going to be useful for everything and change everything and be mind-blowing. 
but after you try to apply it to everything, some use cases are going to be better than others. The ones where the benefit is more clear remain and slowly start to become the foundation of the new normal. Okay, so let's look at some positive, positive examples. Um, some cases that make me think game engines might find the right use case and build the tools for the next generation of the technology. Film and TV. Um, there are many examples of the continued use of game engines for virtual production with several big production companies building large LED stages and many more examples of this tech being used in film and TV. There are also multiple animation studios embracing a real-time pipeline, developing the necessary tools and quietly producing great content. Game engines didn't replace existing VFX workflows completely, but instead are finding the right use cases and are being adopted as another tool in the tool belt for visual productions. Using real-time engines simplifies workflows and cuts down production times, making it a pretty solid advantage over existing processes. Architectural visualization. Uh, another industry that has a good use case and the capital to invest in these innovations is the real estate development sector. Having a compelling, visually stunning representation of what a building is going to look like once it's built is key to market and sell those buildings. There is a lot to gain from having easy to use visualization tools that connect directly into the architect's models and that can be presented to potential customers. I have seen many examples of game engine visualizations still being done in this sector, particularly when it comes to high-end, multi-million dollar projects. And training and simulation, a perfect use case for real-time 3D applications that use accurate real-world data, continue to be in the training and simulation sector. Mm -hmm. Game engines may I have many features such as physics, lighting, terrain, weather, sun position, and more that can enable the creation of accurate worlds and testing in a virtual environment. There are some great examples of game engines being used in this context from even before the hype cycle started, and there continue to be more of these applications coming up. Many of these advances in geospatial simulation that happened in the past few years had made possible for these applications to be developed in a fraction of the time, which I believe will make it even more accessible for any organizations to continue to implement. An example of this is the creation of a lunar terrain replica in a real engine used by NASA to test vehicle designs as to help train astronauts. In a more local example, Kiwi company Kiwi Rail created a tunnel safety simulation tool to test how can construction sites be set up to minimize the chances of accidents happening. Right, where to now? Uh, this is when uh, we look into the future and we can make some potentially wacky predictions. The landscape keeps changing rapidly. I mean, yes, I could try to make predictions, but even as I was writing the context for this talk, new stuff kept happening every day. The tech keeps changing, companies and technologies get acquired and shuffled, and new players enter the field. Uh, what I can tell you is that with every breakthrough in the history of technology, it's in the convergence of different things, and especially the timing, that big leap forwards are born. There are many of those developments that came together to create some of the innovations I talk about today, and what can still happen is not defined yet. I have this theory myself that the path forward for game engines and non-games and for many other cool innovative tech is going to depend on what can become profitable in the medium term. At some point, the hype always runs out and the people that invested in the potential of something will want to see results. This does not mean that 
all uh, the other use cases we dreamt about are never going to become real, only that perhaps we will have to wait a little bit longer for the profitable use cases to build the foundations for the rest of us dreamers. I personally have a belief in the potential of game engines to become a vehicle for communication and storytelling, something akin to a new interactive visual language, which will borrow heavily in the learnings of decades of game development. It might not become a reality today, it might ch uh, change shapes and go through many changes before it becomes the new normal, or it might not happen at all. <laughs> but hey, how cool is it to dream about it? And that's my talk. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I think I only have like two minutes if anybody has a question, but otherwise, thank you so much. Sorry that I've been reading, but I find it really hard to remember everything. Uh, thank you. Yes. Checking if anybody has a question. Just uh, yeah. uh, I was just wondering, in terms of well, the downturn in AUC and everything at the moment, and of course everything not making a direct profit is basically gone, um, how do you think, say in two years again, when it starts picking up again, do you see it becoming more integrated or do you see it still being sort of the odd side character, sort of visualization for engineering and civil? Yeah, so what I, again, like wacky predictions, right? But what I see usually is that, you know, if you have one particular use case and you have like funding for that one, that you can start building those connections, integrations, and pipelines, um, that's where things slowly trickle down and start to become, you know, more common. Um, for example, with Epic, there's a lot of um, things that started as a plugin that a particular company built for the use case, but then it gets integrated into Unreal. And once it comes into Unreal, it's something that everybody can use. And that's where you get that momentum. Um, so. Uh, yes, it's slowed down because of the economic things, but I think all of those use cases are happening right now. So, and if we continue to have this, you know, slowly coming in new technologies, um, the, it will continue to grow um, and become normal. Like, you know, it's not, a, it's not the exciting thing, it's just something that we do. Um, at least that's what I hope. <laughs> Anyone else has a question? If no one else has another question, can I? Um, sorry, sorry, second question as well is with like, how much like, at least in my experience, we're handed the federated models, the visualizations, that sort of thing, and it's then our job to try and make something with them. But at the moment, at least in New Zealand, and I think Australia as well, uh, the metadata, the labeling, all the information on that model is severely lacking. So do you reckon that's a matter of us or the tools creating to make that process easier and less expensive? Or is that a trying to educate the drafters and modelers or whoever's doing the modeling work before us? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. So. Um, it comes to that part that I mentioned about, like the two industries coming together and not really understanding each other a lot. Um, the, in, I think like a programmer, right? So for me, it's like, we, if we can't solve it by like all agreeing into something, which is very hard, uh, we can always uh, code our way through that and, and have solutions for it. For example, um, I feel like um, data smith was a good thing in that sense. It's like, okay, we um, can't make all the different tools for architecture work in the same way. Let's make something in between that we can rely on. And, you, you know, you write the tools to read the metadata from different places and make it come together. So if you can enable that, make it easier, uh, you don't necessarily have to all agree on one uh, file type, right? Um, but of course that takes a little bit longer. Um, you know, it's just to be realistic, right? It would be awesome if we all had just the same file type and, uh, you know, uh, we agree on which kinds of things need to be in it. And I know that there's some government um, initiatives to do that, but 
with everything like government takes a long time and tech moves really fast. Uh, so even though that's what we need, it might take a long time to be like, well, we're all going to do things this way right now. Um, so in the meantime, it's just having those pipelines to enable that, what I see. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Cheers.